Hi, you guys. Hello. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it that you're here. Um, as you know, my name is Kathy. Feel free to call me by my first name. <laughs> I am going to put on some valor because I need some valor right now. I'm feeling a little bit shaky. This is the first time I've presented like this. Like I've been doing lots of trainings and other things, but ah, this is a different format. So I'm excited to, uh, to try it out on you guys, and I'm open to all kinds of feedback, both positive and negative. And at the end, we'll have questions. So let's just start here about talking about what we have here. This is a full set of chakra chakra bowls. These are crystal bowls and they're tuned to the frequency that vibrates into your centers that match the colors. And everybody kind of knows what your colors are, I'm sure. So we also have crystals here as well. And part of the reason why we have both kinds is because the crystal bowls, when you play them, they activate you, right? Regular crystals, as they sit, they have a consistent frequency. Once they've been programmed, that's what they give off consistently. Unlike us, who are kind of all over the map with our frequencies. This is my personal favorite. I travel with this one. And I have had the greatest experience recently at the dentist's office, believe it or not. I was feeling so much fear. You know, I was about on my fifth dental appointment and I remember to take this crystal and I put it on my what is that right there your liver your lily liver your yellow belly liver <laughs> all of those those places collect fear and when I set that there what it did was it uh, it pulled all the energy of the fear out of my body crystals can be so powerful uh, they're quite amazing. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. And then we'll start into talking about the book. <sighs> Let's see. Let's start with our ground. And if you'll just feel into your feet. Maybe wiggle your toes. Uncross your legs. That allows the energy to move up very nicely I would ask you to turn a soft heart to me. This uh, particular volume, uh, Healer Forged in Fire, is a very intimate look at my life and what it has taken to help me arrive here as the introduction that Billy said 
Um, I do come from born and raised a carnival family. And so I want to uh, share just a few excerpts out of the book here and there as we go. There's a few of us out there, the children of the carnival, born and raised. We lived in a magical in-between world. It was there one moment and gone the next. I am the third generation. My kids are the fourth. What others might deem as a normal childhood was never in the cards for us. My folks traveled to Alaska later on in our life and bought a carnival up there in Alaska. And we had that in operation for 47 years. And it still is within the family. But I have moved on. And I'm doing this work now because I've been really drawn to do this work. But what I do have to say is I still love the feeling of the Midway. It's an excitement that washes over me, even after all the years. To my heart, it feels like coming home, with the bright swirling colors, smells of sweetness in the air, popcorn popping, cotton candy spinning, and all things fried, especially onions. <laughs> I love the sounds of the laughter everywhere, and the whirling machines, the people shrieks with excitement and delight. The carnival was a wild ride. <laughs> almost, there is nothing I would almost change about it except for the fire. In the summer of 1961, the fun and games of carnival life came to a screeching halt for me and my family. At four years old, my universe literally blew up a 100 pound propane cylinder in the center of the Carnival Midway exploded and five people died. And uh, many people were burned, including me. I was severely burned, 80% um, of my body, third degree burns. I spent almost six months in the hospital. I had 19 skin graft operations. And I learned so much. <laughs> Even at four years old, you know, the thing about it is, is there's nothing like pain to wake you up. And even at four years old, boy, I tell you, I was fighting for my life, and I woke up. And I remember so much of what it was like in those early days. What I remember most uh, was, of course, my folks. You know, they were really there. My mother rushed into the fire. She grabbed me out. She ripped my clothes off and rolled me in the dirt. She burnt her own hands. Then, when I in, was in the hospital, she sat next to my bed and prayed for me and held my hand and poured her energy into me for days and weeks on end and watched the monitors raise as she was doing with her mother's love, what you can do. It's, it's so powerful. And then the next day she'd come back and I'd be down again and then she, and it just went on and on until I could stabilize. My father was my hero. He uh, would come and sing to me. He told me stories about my grandfather who um, had a uh, traveling sideshow in the South during the Depression with a wrestling bear named Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, him and his four, or his three other siblings, they, they traveled. Um, and he was a true gypsy, not just in lifestyle, but also in bloodline. My favorite story about my father is when he uh, rode the window washing equipment up 16 floors with my little dog to show me my dog in the window of my hospital room. And when I saw him rise up in the air, I'll never forget. It was like, oh God, my dad is Superman. You know, it was really, really uh, a big moment for me. You know, the other big moments in the hospital had to do with when I wasn't having surgery. Um, 
there had been a, uh, an article that was written and it went worldwide. And so all of a sudden I started receiving all these cards and letters from all over the world and sometimes even presents. And the cards always ended, most always, so we will be praying for you. Now my mom put a world map next to my bed and she would put a star from every place that I received a card. And I'd look at that wall and I would think, this world loves me. <laughs> I, I felt uh, really, uh, really, really supported. And that taught me about long distance prayer and because how much that really built me up to know that uh, the world was out there. And they cared about each other and they cared about me. So, so that was part of the lessons that I learned. And when I got out of the hospital, my mother told me about her prayers and how my energy would rise. And I thought, geez, that was just the coolest thing. I want to be able to do that too. I want to be just like my mom, <laughs> you know, and be able to help people with love and healing prayers. And so, and so that's, that was my life for quite, for, you know, a year anyway, which felt like a long time when you're four years old. So I get out of the hospital and life goes on pretty good for a couple of years. I'm, I'm recovering, I'm getting stronger, and I'm having a really good time. I, I got to have a pony and people were really nice to me and ah, I was really coming, coming back. And then I, a terrible thing happened. Um, my father, my hero, decided that, uh, I don't know if he decided, but he put my hand in his pants while he was laying down. And at six years old, I became a member of the Me Too group. And uh, from that point on, from six years until I moved out from underneath my father's roof at 17, I, uh, I was never safe. I never felt safe ever again. And I'm telling you one thing, I don't think I have ever really felt safe until I moved to Ashland. This is an amazing community. Uh, you know, I, I just can't say enough about, about getting to be here. But I will by the time I'm done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so. When did you move to Ashland? Eight years ago. Okay. So, so now. Fast forward out of this par portion of the story to Alaska. My folks uh, in the business, they wanted to own their own carnival. And so there was rides that came available in the state of Alaska. My mother got on the phone, called, purchased them with all of the family savings. And, um, and then my dad came home <laughs> from a hunting trip and he was very, very upset. Um, that was the beginning of his violence, his real violence towards uh, the family. Um, and it just kind of escalated as his drinking escalated. But let me just tell you, this was a magnificent juxtaposition being in the carnival world to, um, to the trauma that was going on at home. So we had this business and it was fun and exciting and, and you had to stay in the moment, work really hard, and, uh, and then you never knew what was gonna happen when you got home, but at, you know, at least you could learn to stay in the moment and that was a real gift too. So, all right. Now we're about into high school and I'm doing the best I can. I have learned to like, take and put those things out of my mind. And when those things were happening, I learned to jump out of my body and just, just barely be there. I, I didn't realize that that would end up being a gift later on, that, that ability to, to go up, to take my spirit up has allowed me to expand myself as a healer. But in those days, it was a survival tool and a really powerful one. But I played the flute in the high school band, 
first chair and I was a cheerleader. I tried to do everything opposite uh, to make up for sadness, to be happy. You know, I've always tried to, uh, to lean into the positive. Now, I graduated from high school. I thought I was doing pretty good. The senior superlatives came out and they said, W is for weird Kathy Morton. Oh, well, <laughs> maybe I didn't fool them so great after all. But, but, uh, but I got through it and uh, at 19, my mother, or our family was operating at the state fair in Alaska and there was a gentleman um, that was uh, on the fair board and he had been in a wheelchair for as long as we knew him. But when we saw him this time, he was walking. And we wanted to know how, how did that possibly happen? Well, he said that he had been to psychic surgeons in the Philippine Islands. And, uh, and so there, there were junkets that started to go to the Philippines. And this was, I was 19, so it was 70, 79 or something like that. Okay, so my mother and I traveled to the Philippines with a group of Alaskans. And you know, I really hoped that um, I got a get out of jail free card um, because of all the trauma. I was hoping that when I showed up, these healers would be able to remove all my scars. I just wanted to be a pretty girl and I wanted to compete with all the other pretty girls and have a husband and uh, children. And well, guess what? I got to have that stuff anyway. But, but at any rate, um, that was a particular a particularly important turning point in my life. Not only did I experience the psychic surgery I had, we were there for two weeks and I had one almost every day, but I also um, had an incredible experience with the teaching because as well as having the experience, we listened to lectures on, uh, on how this was possible. And this, is, this was super cutting edge in those, in those days. Um, but we were informed that it really wasn't that unique um, in most uh, developing countries where their modern medicine isn't really viable so much for the common people. Faith healers are huge. These particular guys were amazing. Um, we stayed in a, in a, a high rise hotel in, uh, in Manila and then one day we traveled to Baguio and then we went to uh, Sister Josephine's Chapel on the South China Sea. Now that was the most memorable of all of my psychic surgeries. Sister Josephine was standing with a table like about like this in the middle of a very hot chapel and next to her was a woman that she spoke through she never said a word, but the woman would, would translate what was coming from sister. And she said, would the mother of this child come and stand at her feet? And that kind of shocked me because there had been no introductions made. We just pulled up in a big bus and walked into the chapel. How did she know my mother was there? Well, she did. So sister Josephine took cotton about this long long and she pressed it and I could feel this she pressed it in the base of my skull here and then from the outside she moved her hands very slowly all the way down and when she got to my tailbone she pulled out this long wad of cotton and it was just dripping with blood clots and she repeated it and did it on the other side oh <laughs> My mother saw that and it was just like her eyes were this big and uh, it was, that was huge. What that did in that moment was like totally shift at 19 what I believed human potential was possible. I mean, these things are possible. We can do these things. So that was pretty exciting uh, to get that opportunity to have that experience. When I got back from that trip, I started reading. I read so much. Uh, this bookstore would have been amazing for me back in those days, but books were pretty hard to come back by in, in the late 70s. Well, lots of, uh, I was recommended to read, um, um, okay, so 
uh, Yogananda. He was, he was uh, Mr. Kunanan, who was the president of the Association of the Philippine Healers, he, um, he said that that book woke him up. So that Autobiography of the Yogi was my first book I read, and then it just went on from that. Joel Goldstein, and you know, the list just goes on and on of the, of the early people um, that were real groundbreakers in those days, and I read as much as I possibly could. And it made me stronger. I felt like I was really coming into myself. And uh, there was a time when my dad quit drinking. And he became the vulnerable one because he drank, drank all of his life. He was shaking and it was, that was my window, guys. I, uh, I told my mom what, uh, what had been happening to me for my life. And uh, everything shifted after that. He left. I, I actually told him he needed to go and not come back, and uh, he did. And so from that point on, things really got interesting and better. My life got a lot better after that point. But I was still so angry. I was really angry about what had been done, and I really didn't think there was any way I could ever come to a place of forgiveness. But in the meanwhile, I wanted to have a family. So I met a nice young man. We ended up getting married and having a couple of kids. And life was pretty good. Life was very exciting. But he didn't like my spiritual practices very well. He thought, he thought they were a waste of time. And, so I just kind of let that stuff fall by the wayside and leaned into the family life. But, geez, I felt like something in me was not being honored. Okay, well, that being the case, er, that the marriage didn't last. But the kids lasted really good. They're doing great, by the way. <sighs> Where am I here? So, I am in my mid-30s, and life is moving along. And then I am working at the fair, um, the last big event, and uh, I heard this voice. I didn't, it, it was kind of rare. I don't think I'd heard a voice before. And it said, what are you doing? Are you doing, or what are you here to do are you doing it, is what exactly. And it was a pretty loud voice. And I was looking at this huge job I'd created for myself. And oh, my kids were almost old enough. And so I decided that I would go ahead and leave Alaska. Excuse me. Let me just have a little. Shall we have a little drink of water, everybody? It's pretty hot out here. <laughs> Let's warm up a little bit again, shall we? Play the heart bowl. I didn't leave right away. I had to have some friends come and get me. <laughs> James and Rosemary Hughes from Ashland, Oregon, arrived in Alaska bringing crystals, so many crystals and so much information, so much wisdom. And I was so excited, it was like, I. Something inside of me knew crystals, you know, when, when, you're, when you really know. And I definitely really loved James and Rosemary. They were so warm and friendly and uh, kind. You know what, what I, I've had lots of different teachers in my life, but these guys have been the most consistent. And partly because they honor everyone. No one is is less than or greater than. Um, we might be, they might be a couple steps ahead in some area, but you know, James always said, I learn and I grow from every single person that comes into my environment. And Rosemary was such a wonderful, wonderful friend and person to, to have as his support system. 
they did all their workshops out of their home. When I came for my first workshop in the year 2000, I stayed at the Shrews Inn across from, and I was walking down the street and I go, Martin Street, what? Hey, that's my last name. I thought that might have been a sign, you know? And I'm looking around at this town and I'm going, geez, I could really live here. This is really cool. I like this place. But, you know, I had a whole big life going on in Alaska, so I couldn't see it at the time how to get here. But here I am. So right before I left to come to this workshop in 2000 here at James and Rosemary's, I, uh, I got a call. And the voice on the phone said she was my father's partner. Now, I hadn't heard anything from my father since he left, and it had been almost 20 years. She said, uh, we live in Portland. Your dad wanted me to call to tell you uh, that he's dying. And I said, OK, um, let me have your phone number. And so I took down her phone number, and I just kind of set it aside because I couldn't even begin to think about that right at that moment. But I happened to be traveling through Portland to come to this workshop, and I had a four-hour layover on my way home. So I knew what I was supposed to do. So I went to, uh, and I knocked on the door of my father's house, and he was laying in a hospital bed, um, in the living room, and the only thing to me that was recognizable about the man was his hands. His hands, um, they were, I remembered how cruel his hands had been. He was just so gray and shriveled, and you know, I was just like, wow, that's karma. <laughs> that is karma. You know, you, I, I came to believe in that moment that you don't get away with anything. You know, there, uh, so. That being the case, um, he wouldn't look at me. And he just kind of laid his head off to the side, and I could see tears running down. And I, you know, I don't know how I did this or where it came from, but I bent down and I said, you didn't break me. I turned out strong. I'm all right. I forgive you if you can forgive yourself. So uh, so as I'm leaving, I had packed a couple of crystals. That voice had come in before I left and told me to take these two Alaskan crystals. They're small, not that clear, but they're special because they come from Alaska. And during the workshop, I talked to James about it because the voice said I was supposed to give them to my father. Well, in that moment, I handed these crystals to his partner and I said, um, put one in each hand, and that will help him light the way on the other side. And then my little girl voice kicked in in my head, saying, he's going to need it where he's going. <laughs> 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 but I didn't say that to his partner, but I thought that. Anyway, so I get back in the cab. The meter had been running. I'd only been in there maybe 20 minutes or half hour. And I sit down. And the minute I sit in that cab, I get rolling thunder all along the energy of my back. It just went on and on. And it just released and released and released and released. I couldn't believe it. I said, now that, is, uh, that was the gift that I had no way of anticipating. And I had no idea that that's how it really worked. <laughs> So uh, it, there was that. OK, so now I'm back in Alaska. And I have sent for a piece of equipment that, uh, that James and Rosemary had created. And it's very special. It's about the, and I ha I've got more than one of these, but I've got a really cool one at my house. It's about the size of this table. And it's called an axiotonal grid. And it's made of copper, and it has silver solders, little squares. Um, and each solder is an acupoint, and each square is a vortex. You put crystals on this 
gigantic transformational piezoelectric contraption and it causes the energy not just to work in an electromagnetic way, but it causes it to shift and bring in the auric as well, because that's what crystals do. They, they work both with the electromagnetic and the auric field. And I've got about 2,000 pounds of crystal on this grid. So, so it's a ride. And then up above, James had created a thing called a, a light spectrum. Now I've seen other ones have, have come in and out since then, but this was the first one. I think he might have even invented it for all I know. But it's all the chakra colors and it shines through these vocal crystals at the frequency of the colors all along the top of your massage table. So. It's a lot of fun, and I work with that every single day. I'm on it all the time. So, what do I want to tell you about that? So I started working with that grid in Alaska, and I, and I, opened, a, I opened a little practice, and it was wonderful and fun, and um, I started working with people, but it was very difficult to keep packing and unpacking my practice, because I had to go to work. I had, you know, I still had my kids to get through college, and and uh, pay the bills and so my food I had a food operation that's what I did at the carnival I own many food wagons and so um, so that's what I continued to do until I just couldn't do it anymore till the voice told me you know am I that I was supposed to leave and that was in the year 2011 it took me a year to get all my l big life down to a van and ship it out. And then I uh, traveled around for about six months trying to find a good place to land. I ended up in uh, Vancouver, Washington um, and into this abyss and I didn't know. I, all I knew is the voice told me to, my heart told me to, and you know, uh, what I was doing wasn't bringing me joy anymore, even on the carnival. So here I am in this magnificent little apartment, and I had gone shopping. I went and, and I bought some flowers, and I wrote myself a love note even. Do you ever do that? Kathy, you're beautiful. I love you. You're doing great. Put it on the flowers, and the sun was starting to set. And I take a picture of the flowers, and I see that there's this thing coming in the window. It's like, what is that? And it just got bigger and bigger and brighter and brighter, and it kind of scared me in the beginning, but it felt really familiar. And it smelt like flowers. And it felt like more than one. And they let me keep their picture. So. Lately, or ever since I've been, I've been taking these pictures of like amazing things. They show me these. I'll just pass this around. This is a picture of the beings. So, so I took the picture, and meanwhile, I'm living in Vancouver, and I'm running back and forth to Ashland so I can hang out with James and Rosemary <laughs> and and Brian, my friend Brian, the star man. And geez, I just love being here. You know, being close to like-minded spiritual people. Oh, fast forward to a year later, and I hear the uh, James and Rosemary come to visit me at my house in uh, in Vancouver, and uh, James hands me a business card, and he says, "This lady will help you find a place in Ashland." It was a a, a card from Annette Pugh, and uh, she was a good friend. She's a she for a long time she upheld this whole community. Her and her husband Lance were pioneers and they helped build the creek area and they had a lot of businesses. Anyway, she was a, she ended up being a great, a great friend and a really good uh, person here in Ashland for me, but I didn't know her yet, so I put her card on the altar and I didn't, I didn't want to move right away because, you know, I just thought I needed another sign. Well, guess what? The voice came in and said, buy now. <laughs> buy now? Oh, wait a minute. I like to put my toe in the water before I make a big jump like, like everything. But 
by now. Okay, so I came to Ashland and the second house that I looked at was on the corner of Morton, my last name, and Alaska Street. <laughs> and the address is my birthday. So how many, how many signs do you need? You know, and I went over to James, you really think this is the place? Are you kidding me? He said, <laughs> how big of a sign do you need, Gath? Okay, all right, I got it. Okay, so, so I moved into the corner of Morton, Alaska, and I started, uh, I started, you know, having a really good time. I enjoyed, sorry about that, I'm out of the thing. Here's some, here's some other good pictures of uh, spirit beings that I took on a trip. Um, also, I'll just go ahead and say it now, this book, this front cover on this book, this is an actual picture that was taken by one of my students of me in Hawaii, and then even this one here with this big rainbow bridge coming in through me, that was also taken of me. Uh, and there's some other cool pictures in this book too. Um, signs and wonders are everywhere and synchronicities and voices and you know as soon as I moved and I made the commitment to really allow this to be my life everything started to step up to support okay so they're building my house on uh, I, the corner of Morton in Alaska it was a little three-car garage the place wasn't so great but it had potential so I ended up building a, my very own place uh, in the back, uh, converting a three-car garage to, uh, and I got to put crystals in every corner as it was being built, all the way up to like set the grid. And then the other thing that Spirit told me to do was put sacred geometry, pictures of masters, angels, and put them all behind the sheetrock. <laughs> right? So all, so I've got hundreds of these sacred pictures behind the walls. Okay, so this was happening and uh, in the meanwhile I had gone into Portland and my mother had just got back from Europe. Things had been kind of shaky since I left Alaska. You know, uh, it was, she didn't take it well that I, that I walked away from the family business. So I was really hoping she'd be so excited for me on the corner of Morton, Alaska. Mom, can you believe it? Well, she wasn't all that happy. <laughs> she still wasn't too pleased with me. And it was really sad. And I cried all the way home. We, we got in a fight. I walk into the house I, uh, where I'm staying on. And I go and I get on this grid. And I start, first of all, I cry because you should always let your emotional body out first so, so that can calm down. You can get down to the real meat of what's going on. So I'm laying there, and all of a sudden, like everything shifts. The light shifts in the room, and this energy wafts in. It's huge. It's this huge energy. It was like the size of a planet. And this being spoke to me. She said... She was a white buffalo woman, and she wanted to be included in the masters, the pictures of the masters. She wanted, I didn't know what she looked like, and I didn't, I, I didn't even know who she was at that particular moment, but okay. But it was scary, because it was so big, <laughs> and she talked. But I listened, and I got off the grid, and I sat down, and I remembered that 10 years earlier, when I had been in Hawaii, I had met uh, up with a friend and done some energy work with her and she'd given me a book called White Buffalo Comes Singing and it was by Brooke Medicine Eagle. And so she gave me that book and I thought, oh, well, that's lovely. Um, but it's really not my thing. So what I did then was put it in my pile because after all, you don't give away gifted books or at least I don't. And um, on this day, I dug that book out, and sure enough, it matched, it totally matched the Buffalo Woman, and I knew that that was the truth, that that, that, that was who that being was. Okay. So, the picture. The picture was created by Emily Waymere. She is a magnificent artist here in town, but I didn't know she was an artist. I knew she was a healer. But she does spiritual art. She also has done like book covers and things like that. So when I 
communicated with the buffalo woman that I didn't know how to paint, and I just did that in my mind. She spoke Emily's name to me. Okay, I didn't know that, but she knew. Okay, great. Picture's up. It's in my house. Now I'm meditating in my home, my new home, and I'm in my healing room on the grid, and she comes back. And this time she asks for a drum. She asks for a big drum to, uh, for, to create unity in community, is what she said this drum was to be built for. So um, I don't know how to build a drum. <laughs> she said his name, Brian Porter. Brian Porter, the star man, apparently, had done five years of drum building workshops in Colorado, and I had no idea. But the Buffalo woman knew, and I thought that was way cool. I, and then, you know, I started wondering, I wonder if she knows like everybody's everything or just Ash, I, I don't know. But, so that was a pretty cool. Here I am in Ashland and all this has happened and I'm really starting to enjoy my community. And then we start to dance. The dancing is very special here in Ashland. Brian, uh, Brian brought me to, to dancing here. I, I'm off topic. I need to just stop for a minute, play some bowls, <laughs> find my place. <laughs> While I was living in Vancouver, back in Vancouver, I traveled to the place where I was burned. There is a town called Odessa, Washington, and it is in eastern Washington. It's a little farm town, and that's where the accident happened. And it occurred to me that I should go there. I wanted to see it with my adult eyes. And there were some other things I wanted to experience and know about. One of the things was I wanted to know the people that died. There were five people that died in that fire. I wanted to know their names. I wanted to somehow honor them. I, I put their names in the book. That's um, The other thing might be a little bit more of a stretch, and that is I believe time is circular, <laughs> not linear. And so I thought if I showed up, at that location and put myself right on the spot where I had been burned, I could call back my essence. I had actually had similar experiences in different, different ways doing stuff that was along those lines, so it seemed possible and I didn't take anybody with me except for my dog because I thought they might think I was crazy and I wasn't so sure I wasn't. But this first time I went, it was raining, so I couldn't sit on the ground. Over the next the course of seven years, I traveled there two more times. One, more, one time I did get a chance to sit on the space, and then I brought the big drum one time, and friends, and we drummed. I don't know how successful that was, but I did feel more complete. It did seem to help. It certainly helped to know the people's names and to see the place and to um, just kind of make peace with, with that whole environment. Now we're getting into, Kathy wants to open up her healing session studio and really get rolling, but I didn't, I mean, there's so much, so much going on here in Ashland. I didn't really know how to start, but there were friends that kept going to see John of God in Brazil, oh, the psychic surgeon right from this community, and I thought, oh, geez, I wonder if that could be anything like the Philippines. And I have a 60th birthday coming up, and I'm going to treat myself to a trip to Brazil. And I went, and it was spectacular um, to have that experience, and quite <laughs> different from the Philippines. It was felt much more like a community experience. There were... Um, thousands of people that came there to experience blessings and healings. Um, those were the visitors. There were a lot of people that just stayed and just held space for the healing that was happening. 
And then as you're coming up on onto the street where the casa is, there's crystals. There's crystals upon crystals upon crystal shops. So crystals are transmitters. Of course, they're transmitting this healing energy as well. And of course, there's John of God who said it was only um, through him, it was not him that was doing the healings. It was through him that they were happening. And then I believe there's something to be said about the uh, placebo effect. What we believe and what we lean into um, really makes a difference in our intent and in our success. So that was great. Had a wonderful time, but before I left, a couple of my good close friends said, you need to make sure that you have really good clean boundaries when you go there. And I wasn't sure why, but I certainly heeded their advice and uh, was very mindful to always set myself in the flow of the highest and the, and the best. The, that type of energy, that type of, I like to see it as a pillar. And, and this pillar, if you can set your boundaries up correctly, you can really be a sovereign. And that's, I think, what we really all are kind of leaning into and don't even realize it. There's that struggle between being separate and being together. And if you are able to hold your sovereignty and your boundaries, you can have it all. I have a workshop about that. So let's see what else we got here. The other thing that I learned there was about the heart space. You know, when I first came into, it's called the current room. Uh, it's like this, there's prayer, people praying and they're all filing past to go see John and it was the most powerful energetic room I'd ever been in. And it really scared me and so I sat to protect my space because I'm all about keeping myself safe, believe it or not. I don't know why I would have an issue around safety, but I do. <laughs> so, um, so during this time, I realized that uh, my biggest prayer while I was there is I wanted to know what was holding me back from really being a, a good, effective healer. And I... As I was sitting there that first day, it felt like everybody that walked by that had any kind of non-forgiveness was laying it right on my lap. I was twitching around like a fish and I was getting angrier and angrier. And um, I realized then that that was what I had asked for. I wanted that information about how I had not forgiven all the way. Uh, and then I realized that, you know, Forgiveness is an onion, and stuff just keeps coming up, and you just got to keep working through it, working through it, and every time you work through it, you get a little bit more light of your very own back, it seems like. So that's been a, that's been a really positive portion of this. Now, I've gotten a little bit off topic because it felt important to talk about these these particular aspects they're not necessarily addressed in the book but there's a lot that is addressed in this book so protecting your heart space is very important and you know we really can build uh, if we don't do any other boundaries this boundary around our heart and when we choose to open and allow open it full open like at the dance <laughs> And sometimes not, you know, and really being able to modulate when is the best time to be in that space has been really helpful for me. After I was with John, I made some really good friends there. And I traveled to New Mexico in the van. And, um, and then I brought back a friend. Her name was Tara Pressler. She was a professor and a, a speech elocution coach and uh, she wanted to help me. So we drove the Alaska Highway in the van and um, she coached me all the way to get ready to do more speaking. 
When I was in Alaska, I also took the drum. We did some drumming events and I had a, I had a vision or a dream or a knowing that I was to do the same thing that I did in Odessa, taking myself to the place of the trauma and bringing myself back in. So I drove my van and my friend and my drum to the site where at 12 years old um, I was raped. And I parked on that spot. And I just opened myself up and I just wept and I was angry and then I crawled in the back of the van and I laid under the drum and I asked for my heart to be healed. I invited my little person back in because you see when that, when that happened, something shattered inside of me. Um, you know, at 12 years old I didn't realize that the body is hardwired to respond to stimulation. My heart and my mind wanted no part of that. So I broke in, I broke in pieces and my little girl went away and I just punished, I punished her for my whole life for ha having some kind of a, an okay response to the, to the stimulus. When I was under that drum, I was able to, for the first time, forgive myself, invite that little girl back in and hold her and let her know that I'm here for her. I won't let anything hurt her anymore and uh, she's safe now. And when I forgave that little person inside of me, that was the first time I really was able to access any true self-love. And once again, that's one of those pieces that was like the onion. But I peeled off a great big layer in, in there in Alaska. And so after that, when I came back to Ashland, it was like, oh, I hit the ground running. I was so excited. I had all these things going on, and we had workshops to go to. And, and I was traveling, and oh, I had students, and I was so happy. And then, of course, the rug gets pulled out from under you, because isn't that life? My mama died. And um, then six days later, Brian died. And then three months later, Annette died. And then, six months after that, my grandson, three years old, drowned. And I just felt like bang, bang, bang. I was just leveled and I really, I couldn't do anything at this point but grieve. Um, and my whole life I had pushed grief away. I, have, I would not allow myself to grieve. I was always afraid that if I went there that I would drown. You know, there was, had just been so much. Um, but it was no choice at this point. If I was going to have any, anything come back, any strength, anything, um, I, would, I needed to feel it all. And uh, like I said, it, it just about sunk my boat. Um, okay, so now here comes COVID. <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> If you didn't feel it before, why don't you lock yourself in your house for two years and see if you can't bring it up now, right? Didn't everybody like, oh man, that was the days of trauma. That was really hard getting through that. You know, some days I would walk um, to the park and sit across the street on the bench and look at my friend's house <laughs> across the street or watch traffic going by on Siskiyou just to see people, you know? <laughs> We just didn't know. We didn't know what, what, what was happening, and it was such a frightening time. Um, okay, COVID. Next.
wildfire. <laughs> right? <laughs> I tell you what, that wildfire, it rocked me to my core because it was out of control, I wasn't safe, and I had no idea that I still held so much trauma, like almost in my DNA. When it gets really smoky around here and I can smell it and it's heat, um, it feels like I'm back there again. And um, so I had to get out of here. <laughs> I went to the coast, and then I went to New Mexico, and I went just about anywhere I could go in order to get away from the fire and, uh, and the COVID. The last year of the COVID, I reached out to some very special students of mine. Um, they're the, the late, my friend wrote the foreword in the book, and um, she's the one who took the pictures. She had, uh, she had had a huge awakening in, right in my environment um, at, at one of these events, um, the psychic events that I, that I do in Hawaii. I, I had, had traveled to Hawaii to do that. So she ended up uh, coming down here, um, selling her house and, and moving. But before she did, uh, we went to a workshop together on the Big Island. And it was a huge workshop. Everybody there was so special. Um, I missed an important part to tell you about. I have to go backwards, you guys. I apologize. I got to tell you about Sacred Ground International. When I was uh, bef right before the COVID happened, uh, and it was about it was in June. Um, the year that, uh, six months after my mother died, I was meditating again and the voice said, call Brooke Medicine Eagle. So I called her and she said she was putting together, and she had been in a fire also. We had that in common. She said she was putting together a, um, uh, a workshop on Sacred Ground International, which was a buffalo retreat in Montana. So I said, oh, great. Um, when can I come? Well, it's not quite ready yet. You know, we don't have facilities. That's OK. I've got a van. When can I come? <laughs> so she invited me to come. And, uh, and it was so very special. Um, I'd like to read a little excerpt about, um, about that time with her, with them in, in, uh, on sacred ground. Got the buffalo pictures here. Brooke greeted me as soon as I walked through the door of the museum. I was immediately in awe of Brooke's beauty and vitality. About 5'2", with long gray braids, piercing eyes, the color of bright blue sky, and a wiry body. She was meticulously dressed and adorned with turquoise jewelry that brought out her eyes, not that they needed it. In her early 70s, Brooke was unquestionably one of the most striking women I had ever met. When I took her hand in introduction, I could feel the ancient wisdom radiating from her very bones. We traveled through four gates on Sacred Ground International to get to the Buffalo Reserve. And uh, Tana was standing outside to greet us. She was the owner of the ranch where she facilitated sacred buffalo hunts in the traditional way of honoring all beings and all relations. Tana is the guardian of the land and the herd. Her people call her Buffalo Heart Woman. Tall and lean, she was so elemental, it felt like she was part of the land. She was part of the herd, she was the ranch with thick, Light brown tousled hair and hazel eyes with gold flecks, Tana was a natural beauty. She took my hand and gave me a long look that went straight to my soul. I was confused and deeply moved. I asked her what was happening and she said, most people look at others and don't really see them. I really see you. I'd grown used to people taking me at face value and not seeing me. It was beautiful and humbling to have this medicine woman look into my heart on our very first meeting. She, those women 
each had very, very special uh, teachings for me. Uh, Tana taught me, uh, we, we went to the herd out, and, and it's free range buffalo, so we went in the all-terrain vehicle in search of the herd. We didn't have to look that long. They're pretty big, hard to miss. Um, Brooke helped me realize physically in my body how we're all connected to the land and each other. The, the particles, the waves, it's all there. She took me to a, uh, a valley where it's, it was called Smallpox Valley. Her people named it that where hundreds of uh, Native Americans were just tossed during the smallpox er epidemic and no ceremony, no nothing. And so we did a ceremony there. There were lots of lessons and it was a life-changing experience to, to be able to go there and be with them. Um, the day after returning home, I was standing in my bathroom brushing my teeth and thinking about the white buffalo woman and wondering if I was still on her radar. No sooner had that thought, that question, that the lights went out and the water shut off. Boom! That fast. And then came right back on. I was like, oh. So now, I just assume I'm always, she's always with me, you know. She's my guide. And I don't know why I got to be chosen. I mean, I'm not Native American. I'm gypsy, and that's a tribal people, but, you know, um, I was just recently at a gathering uh, back east for um, the, the big equinox. Uh, um, and um, someone spoke that the white buffalo woman, a, a gentleman an, an, from India, said the, the woman visited him and had requests for him. And he was asking the Native Americans why why me? And the chief said to him, and I felt like this was a message for me also, that um, you don't think this is your only lifetime, do you? You have had Native American lives. So I, I believe that that's true for me as well. I think I'm done. Except, I'm going to read you one last thing. So at that workshop in Hawaii, there were many really cool things happened, but right before this happened here on the, in the water, on another day, Spirit led the women of our group to a sacred healing ponds found at the edge of the ocean where the ancient lava fields create natural pools. Light dance and waves replenish the sacred healing site while we bathed in community as women have done through the ages. On this magical day in this very sacred place, I felt a freedom like never before. In a deep state of gratitude for my body, just as it was, for the first time I embraced all the ways I was perfectly imperfect, just like everybody else. Joyfully, I tore off all my clothes and I jumped into the pool, <laughs> not asking if anybody minded. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for holding space with me. And uh, I hope you got something valuable out of that. Let's just have one more little tune, and then we'll have questions.
good, some of it not so good, but you guys will figure it out. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I guess we're open for questions. Yes, Harmony. Um, what is the healing bath thing that you do? The healing bath. Yeah. This is called a sound bath. Okay. And this is what the healing bath is. Okay. Okay. So you kind of left off, I think, the end. So you spend all this time wanting to be a healer. And so how did you get to the point where you began to be a healer practitioner? Good question. <laughs> How did I get to that point? Well, you know, it just started, oh, it just started happening, you know. Um, but a lot of it happened because of the work I did with the crystals. And then there was a particular occasion, I call it the midnight ride in the book, where my friends and I were in Las Vegas. And we were going to have some fun. I was going to speak at my mother's convention she was uh, she was being honored by the industry for her contributions and I was the MC okay fast forward to this story <laughs> all right my girlfriend got a call her daughter had been thrown off a horse her brain had swollen she was in the hospital and we were to come right away uh, we drove all night we get to the hospital I had been initiated in Reiki. I'd been training for quite some time. Um, and when I started transmitting, the energy was so strong, it almost knocked me over. And I couldn't put my hands on her. I had to do it from a distance. And she came out of it. She, her brain shrunk that first night. And then the next day it shrunk more after I worked on her. The nurses couldn't believe it, but there it was. There was verifiable, reproducible proof on the monitors and witnesses that that was something that I, that I had a gift for. And that's when I knew it was time to really step into what I was supposed to be doing. Did that answer your question? Right, and so you do that kind of healing work? Now? I do. I do. I do. I still do. Absolutely. I do hands-on. I um, and I travel all over with the van. I like to go. I like to do energy events at, at like fairs because people are ready to wake up. And every now and then, I will meet somebody that wants to be a student. That's one of my main focuses: is mm -hmm. is uh, is finding out if people would like to be initiated in Reiki. And uh, sometimes somebody, like Adela in this book, will have the hugest experience on the table that totally shifts their life. And I helped. <laughs> and that's pretty great. Does anyone else have any questions? So I'm trying to picture the, the, the metal thing with the crystals and the lights. Does that hang over top of the person who's on the bed, like yes. this John of, John of God construction that also does that? Is it similar? Well, there was one. There was one that was similar that, mm -hmm. that uh, I actually had for a while. I don't use it anymore since uh, since John is kind of his energy. I'm not really comfortable with sharing <laughs> that. But, but since then, I have uh, purchased my, uh, my mentors, uh, James. Uh, my mentor, James, has been gone off the planet for a couple of years now. And um, so when he passed, he told his family that he wanted me to have this very special piece of equipment. And I have that, and it's in my, <laughs> it's in my healing room, <laughs> and it's on the top, and then underneath is this grid, this, this grid that I explained, and all these, I've got crystals that are like this big, like maybe 2,000 pounds worth of crystal underneath your bed. And then there's handles that you hold on to. They're made of copper, 
and inside they're hollow so they're filled with crystal and then there's a long copper wire that hooks up to the grid and so you do rebirth breathing and the energy just like it it, it, it's, it can be really huge sorry I lost my mic is it okay okay it, will there be any other questions yes um, when you said you heard a loud voice, it made me remember when I heard one once. It was super helpful. Do you know if there's any way I could get it to talk to me again? Or do you know if that's anything I even have control over? Cause <laughs> I think the voice comes in when you need the voice. You know, that's, uh, yeah. Oh, there was another time that the voice came in, right before I went to Hawaii. When I was at my lowest port point and felt like I was going to give up, it said, anoint feet. It's like, what? <laughs> so I, when I was at this training, everything was about essential oils. So I learned how to anoint feet. And you know, that's pretty humbling. And I don't know why I would get to be the person to do that. But anybody wants their feet anoint, I'm your girl. <laughs> Questions? And you, you spoke earlier to calling your little girl back and your soul fragments and and how you you created a process that can help people. I wonder if you'd speak a little bit more. Certainly, you're you're asking for a process that can help people to um, call their essence back. Well. First of all, what I'd like to say is, just like on the grid, the vortex in the center of the square, you are vortexes. We are magnets, we are electromagnetic, we are piezoelectric, and we are auric. All this energy can be channeled through your body and can really, really, really help a lot. But what's also important is to set these boundaries up around yourself. Now, I've learned to uh, recently I, I know this place has got probably many volumes of Carlos Castanegas, who was uh, a foremost authority in energy in the 70s. And back in the 70s, there was a very limited amount of energy coming this way here, but now we all own cell phones. And that's pumping the energy up like this, that's tearing, that's tearing holes. And there's a lot more electromagnetic energy that's moving around in the field. I wish I would have brought in um, a, uh, a graft. I have a really good graft in my van. And we need to get the books out, too. <laughs> and uh, so, so when you're setting the intent to bring in energy for yourself, for your healing, if you would call it in, First of all, you want to call in your highest and connect this way here. And then you call in the energy that you need. You invite it in, and you invite it in with love. Energy comes in mostly the flow through the left, the female side, and release through the right. In this energetic boundary that I have been taught, on this corner, I set my highest good and bringing in my highest good. In this back corner here, I invite in anything that I'm not really ready to deal with yet, but I don't want to let it out of my field. Not quite yet. This corner up here, this right masculine side, on this boundary, I'm going to set, no thank you, bless you, move right on down the line, swipe right, Keep going. <laughs> Anything that does not match with, with my highest good and the highest good of all. That might be handy for somebody else, but I don't need it. So I'm going to let that go with love. And then in this back corner, on the right, this is where my shadow is. And occasionally I'll visit it and see what I need and what I don't need anymore. And then if I don't need it, then I invite it to leave. I invite anything that is no longer in service to, to my intention to go ahead and pass out of my field with love. Because that's going to be handy for somebody else somewhere else. You know, we're all connected. 
this big grid connects everything. And we are not only connected vertically, but we're also connected horizontally in, in the grid. Does that answer your question? OK. Any other questions? Comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. I really appreciate it.